studied philosophy at your graduation level and then you began your research career in neurochemistry. What drew you to the area of supramolecular chemistry and how did you get interested in this area? I did not exactly work in neurochemistry. I was interested. That's quite different. And supramolecular chemistry did not exist. I coined the name in 1978. Before that, the term did not exist. Now, the field existed because there were, of course, phenomena which man calls, which one may call part of supramolecular chemistry, which existed. But you know, that's like a forest. You can see the trees, but at some stage you have to call it a forest. And this is the way supermolecular chemistry came about. Now, very, very briefly, in fact, in a way, I will come back a little bit in my lecture, you will see the sort of the developments. At the beginning, I was interested in the way in which, in the nervous system, there could be molecules which distinguish sodium from potassium ions, which are basic process in the neural, neural system, in the propagation of the action potential in nerves. This led to the idea that there must be molecules which recognize little spheres of slightly different diameter, mm -hmm. alkali ions. Now, how do they, do they recognize? They recognize by interacting with them. Interaction implies getting things together, using non-covalent forces, other forces than the one which link atoms in molecules. And this was then the supramolecular level beyond the molecular level, and that is the way it came about. But it has evolved since then. This is something, for me, supermolecular chemistry that's finished. I mean finished, not finished, but it's a field which is established. Huh? You, don't call, you, you, call, you can call yourself a molecular chemist since uh, 1800s, there's molecular chemistry. Supermolecular chemistry, there were pieces here and there. Now it's well developed, or let's say, one could say 50 years or so. Huh? And it will continue, and now the other things which come out of that. I will very briefly indicate that in this lecture, much more detail in my afternoon's lecture at NCL. To do important work, Nobel Prize winning work, is it vital that the question under investigation be important? Or is it more important that your approach be novel and rigorous? regardless of whether the question has well, wider The question is number one. First of all, don't worry about Nobel Prizes. Many people didn't get it, who should have gotten it? Huh? So, if you get it, fine. It means usually that you have done important work, not because you feel it's important. No, okay, you have to feel it's important what you're doing, otherwise, why should you do it? But it's also that other people have found that it is important because they nominate you. You don't never nominate yourself. That is forbidden. Mm -hmm. Other people nominate. So there are many others who should have had this prize. And the important thing is to, as the question you asked, to find the important problems and to give an answer to them. But it's not only that. No, number of Nobel Prizes, since we, think, we speak about that, but many of important discoveries, also discoveries of tools which make it possible. X-ray crystallography had more than one had several Nobel Prizes. NMR spectroscopy. These are tools which make it possible. Without them, you cannot study the important problems. So they are important tools. And for instance, if you look at NMR, there was a discovery of NMR. Uh, and then there was uh, the uh, changes which led to Fourier transform different techniques. And it ended up in putting your body in one of those machines. Mm -hmm. So see, this it's a, it's a technology based on a fundamental physical property which has been developed to study questions, important problems. For instance, detecting whether you have a tumor in your body. Well, you put yourself in this machine and when it looks at it, it gives you a scan. So this, the fact that the Nobel Prizes, and other prizes of course too, recognize the study and progress in very important problems is of course fundamental. But recognizing also the tools which allow you 
to study these problems is, of course, as important. Without the tools, you can't study. You can have a lot of interesting ideas, but you can't study them. So what? As a PhD student, we sometimes go through difficult phases when progress seems elusive. Has there been any time when you faced such challenges? Of course. <laughs> it's obvious. If you don't do anything, you have no questions, you have no periods where you are disappointed, um, more or less depressed, one could say. But, uh, okay. Can you share some with us? How do you deal with it? Yeah. Uh, you try harder, or uh, this is, no, it's a good question. You have to select an important problem, or what you think is an important problem. And if it doesn't work out, you have to know whether you should stop because the approach is wrong mm -hmm. or the approach is good, but you just try harder. Mm -hmm. This is very complicated. This is always... And after a few years, often you say, I should have continued that because now it's obvious. But others, you stick to it and at the end of the game, you realize that you have been s sticking into it You're in a dead end. This is for all of us, you know, research is research. If you knew the answer, it wouldn't be research. Yes. Huh? Research means you study things, you would like to find the solutions, but you don't have it. You visited Aysar Pune back in 2010, hmm? and you're visiting again now in 2017. Would you like to share your views on how Aysar Pune has changed over these years? No, oh, because it almost didn't exist. At least not the campus. <laughs> So there were a number of people here already, but not in this campus. There were another build NCL, the other around somewhere. So it, you know, it's a well-established institution uh, with, uh, which is trying the, its best to be on the map, to sort of being on the map means having very good researchers, very good teachers, very good students. We you are part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. We often hear from our senior colleagues about funding constraints and certain research fields are better funded over others. In this climate of reduced funding for basic research, we are interested to know if you had any time in your career faced funding difficulties and how did uh, you had addressed such situations? You know, what is a funding difficulty? It is not as much money as you would like to have. If it is that, okay, you often can do with less. Now, if it is very reduced, if it's very low funding, then of course you cannot do what you would like to do. We have had this kind of things. You want to buy a new big NMR spectrometer, you don't have the money, you can't. So we did not necessarily have the best, highest technology uh, available. So you, you know, let's see, to be very practical, you go to a lab where there is a one and you ask to use it. And scientists, are, not all of them, I must say, unfortunately, but usually quite open, you can use the machine. So there are ways around. Funding, the fact that there's not too much funding is not bad. You think better, you think harder because you have to select things. Living in plenty, conditions of plenty, is not necessarily the best way. I wouldn't, I don't, there's no politician here, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, uh, basic research is knowledge, is preparing the technologies of tomorrow. Coming back to NMR, when the first physicist, physicist saw this signal, which was defined as a magnetic resonance signal. They could not predict that someday you would put your body in something which has come from that. So I will give an example of something which for us is very important, which was not predicted, it just came out like this. Because others looked at it and found something interesting in it. We'll see that later. It has to do with uh, uh, biomaterials. Many researchers today struggle with balancing work and home. Uh, in this regard, how would you like to advise young researchers? First of all, young ladies have a much more difficult problem 
than the, mm -hmm. the others. Huh? Yes. That's a problem. In fact, strangely enough, I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to reveal the circumstances, but yesterday we talked about setting up a new university and what about women there? Mm -hmm. Let's say two, let's say extreme approaches for a man balancing uh, the personal life and research. I never asked me myself that question, and for my wife it wasn't very funny, probably. But she was also a scientist, so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> you spend a lot of time, huh? and if you want to go somewhere, you just that is number one what you do. I'm in the lab on Saturdays, Sundays, uh, all the time. Now when I come to India, I take a little bit of time off to see other things. <laughs> so, but that is one thing. It's, it's complicated and you have to dedicate yourself. But I usually say also, maybe some of these questions will come up again. If you are a pianist, you train nine hours a day, all the time, up and down. Not, not just that, of course. If you are a scientist, you have to do the same. If you are a tennis man, you train like hell. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes much more painful. So you have to do the same as scientists and maybe even more. Now for women, that is a very important problem, not just for science, but in general. If you want to have a career, mm -hmm. you have to be, because I don't want to look into genes. For me, X, X or XY is all the same. When people come to the lab, I'm happy to have ladies in my lab, but it's not, I don't select on that, except if they're equal in terms of, uh, then I prefer having a lady because they're less. But otherwise, in a career, how can you help? How can you provide conditions which make it possible for ladies to have a career and a successful one? One way is uh, when they, of course for the moment, Children are still made by ladies, okay? <laughs> so that's the way it is. Uh, so this means that one gives leaves of lapins and all these kinds of things. And this is in France, for instance, is quite a generous leave of absence for maternity, even paternity. The problem is, when you come back, if you are in a field which is experimental science, how can you get back into it? You can, but still, it's not so easy. So another quite different way is to provide the help so that as very early on, children are taken care of by people who help. And in fact, you know, in the ancient noble society, ancient I means in history, there were, uh, in France is gouvernant, governors, ladies who took care of the children. They were not stupid, these children. But the mother could do lots of other things. So I think this depends also on you, on, uh, on the woman in question, whether she wants to take care of the children all the time, mm -hmm. or whether she considers she has also another life where she has her career, and the children can be taken care of in many of the practicalities by somebody else. I'm not sure it's worse. But this depends on each of, each of you. I think women, I think have, a women have a much more difficult time than men. So. so. <laughs>